Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our evening prayer service for this weekend, which has been a, a long weekend, Canada Day weekend. I hope you've had a great time and uh, will continue so. Uh, nice to have Bill with us. He's going to continue reading from uh, Timothy Keller's book, The Prodigal God. Uh, if you're following along at home, as usual, we begin on page 18. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Dearly beloved, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice under the throne of the heavenly grace. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou then the are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfailingly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. No, Lord, open thou our lips. And our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Our psalm is psalm number 85, found on page 439. We'll start at verse 7, uh, responsibly by the half verse. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. I will hearken what the Lord God will say. For he shall speak peace unto his people and to his saints, and unto them that turn their hearts to him. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth springeth out of the earth. And righteousness hath looked down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give what is good. And our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him. 
and shall direct his going in the way. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We'll have our first reading. A reading from Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. Jesus, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciple, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call sinners righteous, but sinners. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On page 21, we say by the half verse, the Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath magnified me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him. Throughout all generations. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat. And hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he hath sent empty away. He remembering his mercy. Hath hoped his servant Israel. As he promised to our forefathers. Abraham and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. A reading from Luke Chapter 19, uh, beginning at verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On page 22, we say the Nunctimidus, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. According to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. To be a light to lighten the Gentiles. And to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen. And mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people. And bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord. And evermore mightily defend us. O God, may clean our hearts within us. And take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Almighty God, whose wisdom and whose love are over all, accept the prayers we offer for our nation. Give integrity to its citizens and wisdom to those in authority, that harmony and justice may be secured in obedience to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And, O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we being defended, from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Enlighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night for the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite Bill to continue our reading for us. Chapter 5, The True Elder Brother. What do we need to escape the shackles of our particular brand of lostness, whether it be younger brother or elder brother? How can the inner dynamic of the heart be changed from one of fear and anger to one of joy, love, and gratitude? The first thing we need is God's initiating love. Notice how the father comes out to each son and expresses love to him in order to bring him in. He does not wait for his younger son on the porch of his home, impatiently tapping his foot, murmuring, here comes that son of mine. After all he's done, there had better be some real groveling. There's not a hint of such an attitude. No, he runs and kisses him before his son can confess. It's not the repentance that causes the father's love, but rather the reverse. The father's lavish affection makes the son's expression of remorse far easier. The father also goes out to the angry, resentful elder brother, begging him to come into the feast. This picture is like a double-edged sword. It shows that even the most religious and moral people need the initiating grace of God, that they are just as lost, and it shows there is hope. Yes, even for the Pharisees. This last plea from the Father is particularly amazing when we remember Jesus' audience. He is addressing the religious leaders who are going to hand him over to the Roman authorities to be executed. Yet in the story, the elder brother gets not a harsh condemnation, but a loving plea to turn from his anger and self-righteousness. Jesus is pleading in love with his deadliest enemies. He is not a Pharisee about a Pharisee. He is not self-righteous about self-righteousness, nor should we be. He not only loves the wild, living, free-spirited people, but also the hardened religious people. 
We will never find God unless he first seeks us. But we should remember that he can do so in very different ways. Sometimes God jumps on us dramatically as he does with the younger son, and we have a sharp sense of his love. Sometimes he quietly and patiently argues with us, even though we continue to turn away, as in the case of the older son. How can you tell if he is working on you now? If you begin to sense your lostness and find yourself wanting to escape it, you should realize that the desire is not something you could have generated on your own. Such a process requires help. And if it is happening, it is a good indication that he is even now at your side. We also learn from this parable that our repentance must go deeper than just regret for individual sins. When the younger brother comes back, he has a long list of wrongdoings for which he must express remorse. When we think of repentance, we think, if you want to get right with God, you get out your list of sins and you tell him how sorry you are about each item. Repentance is not less than that, but it is much more, because the list approach isn't sufficient to address the condition of the elder brother. The older son is lost outside the feast of the father's love. Yet he's got almost nothing on his list of wrongdoings. He says, I never disobeyed you. And the father doesn't contradict him, which is Jesus's way of showing us that he is virtually faultless regarding the moral rules. So how does a person who is lost, yet who has no sins on the list, get saved? Let me be careful to avoid a misunderstanding here. This story is a great metaphor of sin and salvation, but we can't press every single detail literally. Neither Jesus nor any author of the Bible ever implies that any human being is flawless without sin or fault, except Jesus himself. Instead, the point is that it is a distraction to concentrate only on our specific behavioral shortcomings. When Pharisees sin, they feel terrible and repent. They may punish themselves and bewail their weakness. When they finish, however, they remain elder brothers. Remorse and regret is just a part of the self-salvation project. Farcical repentance doesn't go deep enough to get to the real problem. What is that problem? Pride in his good deeds rather than remorse over his bad deeds was keeping the older son out of the feast of salvation. The elder brother's problem is self-righteousness, the way he uses his moral record to put God and others in his debt to control them and get them to do what he wants. His spiritual problem is the radical insecurity that comes from basing his self-image on achievement and performance. So we must endlessly prop up his sense of righteousness by putting others down and finding fault. As one of my teachers in seminary put it, the main barrier between the Pharisees and God is not their sins, but their damnable good works. What must we do then to be saved? To find God, we must repent of the things we've done wrong. But if that is all you do, you may remain just as elder brother. To truly become Christians, we must also repent of the reasons we ever did anything right. Pharisees only repent of their sins, but Christians repent for the very roots of their righteousness too. We must learn how to repent of the sin under all our other sins and under all our righteousness, the sin of seeking to be our own Savior and Lord. We must admit that we've put our ultimate hope and trust in things other than God and that in both our wrongdoing and right doing, we've been seeking to get God or get control of God in order to get hold of those things. It is only when you see the desire to be your own savior and Lord lying beneath both your sins and your moral goodness that you are on the verge of understanding the gospel and becoming Christian, a Christian indeed. When you realize that the anecdote to being bad is not just being good, you are on the brink. If you follow through, it will change everything. How you relate to God, self, others, the world, your work, your sins, your virtue. It's called the new birth 
because it's so radical. This, however, only brings us to the brink of Jesus's message, not to his heart. This tells us that we must turn from, now what or whom we must turn to, we have seen that we need to the initiating love of the Father and this deeper gospel repentance. But there is one more thing we need in order to enter the festival joy of salvation. Next week, we will read who we need. Thank you, Bill. We'll just take a moment of silence to offer our own prayers before Almighty God. And, O oh God, the creator and preserver of all people, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men and women that thou wouldst be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially, we pray for the good estate of the Catholic Church, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith in the unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are anyways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions, and this we beg for Jesus Christ, his sake. Amen. And almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be most expedient for them granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all for now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us uh, this evening. God bless.